City of Gangsters is a pretty deep and varied game with a lot to learn as soon as possible. For the most part, it's fairly intuitive, too. Much of the time, the clues you need are right in front of you, so pay close attention to the detail until you get the hang of things. Just blithely skimming through the early part of the game will only lead to misunderstanding, frustration, stupid mistakes, and likely no small degree of self-flagellation, and probably also get you killed sooner. Take the time to study the many useful map overlays and such buttons on the upper left of the UI. The wealth of information provided in the various windows when they pop up, and even the building descriptions and character dialogues as you play. All this stuff often provides some useful hints and clues, and not just a blurb for the sake of it. During the early days especially, also take the time to mouse over the various icons and buttons on screen, including the notifications appearing along the top of the screen during each turn. And actually think about the info provided. The sooner you grasp the finer detail, the better you will do. In this game, the seemingly small stuff often turns out to be more important than it appears at first glance. I would also strongly recommend that you refer to the encyclopedia. It's in the upper left of the UI, as often as you go, looking up appropriate subjects as you encounter new stuff in the game. Maybe even consider reading at least the main section of the encyclopedia before you do anything else in the game. There are pearls to be found there. So how long will a single game last? I'm tempted to say, until you get gunned down or sent to the can, but if you somehow avoid both these fates, it seems you will have roughly 660 weekly turns before the Legacy Goals kicks in on January 1st, 1933, with the impending end of Prohibition. The really great news is, there's actually nothing preventing you from playing beyond that if you wish, it just simply will no longer count towards the Legacy Goals of that particular playthrough. Now let's talk about Action Points. You will generally begin the game with just three action points per turn, or four if you start with the organized trait. As your character gains experience, you will have the opportunity to increase this by one action point per turn, usually by about turn six through ten, if not sooner. I highly recommend investing your first experience gain in this category, the only other early options being movement or brawling, as action points are needed for almost every useful interaction in the game. Buying and selling, scoping out unknown businesses, calling in favors to spread your connections, and build relationships and respect, etc. Most turns in the early game you should, if you're making the most of your opportunities each turn, run out of action points before you use all your movement points. So for the best possible start over the first 50 turns or so, you want to be able to do as much as possible with your boss character before you have to hit that next turn button. Giving yourself that fourth, action point as soon as it becomes available will essentially allow you to do 33% more per turn and maximize your early expansion and the opportunities able to be taken. Note that the character's experience gain in City of Gangsters is not simply time served, as these things so often are in many games. It is in fact mostly based on such as character traits, what sort of jobs a crew member is doing, perhaps most important for your own boss character, in particular the number and type of actions performed. It seems a good bet that having more action points available sooner and putting them to good use each turn is likely to more quickly occur even more experience gain for your own character. Unused action points are not, however, carried over into the next turn. They are simply lost, which amounts to lost opportunity. It is therefore pays to pause, figuratively speaking, a movement every now and then and actually plan the best route to use them. Both action points and movement points are reduced to zero the instant you initiate violence against a corner hooligan or member of a rival outfit. Yes, this also means you cannot immediately flee if all shit hits the fan. If you really must get physical, at least make sure you are spending your single last action point that turn, and perhaps even the last few movement points to do so. Acting rashly in the heat of the moment or is just a waste, so always take care of your business first. Besides, revenge is a dish best served cold. Now on to movement points. You will generally start the game with about 10 movement points per turn. When moseying along in your starting jalopy, it costs just one movement point to drive to an adjacent corner or unclaimed corner, three movement points to move into a hooligan turf, the ones with the yellow border, or through a rival outfit, the ones with the red border. For each corner traversed within that territory, and a whopping five movement points to explore a completely unknown corner, and learn what's there. Unused movement points are also not carried over into the next turn. 
If you end an exploring move near a newly discovered corner belonging to a hooligan or rival outfit, and you have just one or two movement points left over, consider using them to back off a little and thereby reduce the risk of being immediately attacked on the following turn. There are a lot of aggressive and very territorial goons out there who don't like you sniffing around in their backyard. Whenever possible, it is usually best to avoid antagonizing anyone until you choose to do so, otherwise they can easily become an annoying, delaying and potentially costly distraction for quite a while to come. When you are planning how best to spend your action points each turn, also consider how best to use the available movement points, bearing in mind that you have far more of these. For example, because your early load space is limited, it can sometimes pay to make a single large delivery and then return to base and load up full again before making the next delivery. Even if both customers share the same corner, sure, it may cost a little bit more in movement points, but two large sales is better than one large one, and a much smaller one just to sell what's left in the trunk. Aim for maximum value from your few action points, and consider spending extra movement points where needed to achieve that. When you do run out of action points, don't just hit that next parent button without a second thought. Look at your remaining movement points. Sometimes there will be still a surprising amount left over simply because you spent that turn operating in a very localized area and barely moving. So are you maybe near enough of an unexplored area to head over there and investigate another corner before you end the turn? Failing that, what are your priorities for the next turn? Is it worth maybe moving someplace else before the end of turn to get a jump on things? Plan ahead whenever possible. Now let's talk about money. This is what it's all about. The start of the game, you'll have a relatively little cash supply, but instead have a shed load of unsold booze handily stashed in the storeroom of a legitimate business owner, at least on paper, by a relative of yours, this building being considered your starting safe house, though we'll call it your starting base of operations. It's not really safe, but we'll get into that. The very first priority you should have is to turn the starting booze stock into a cold, hard cash by selling as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Whether it's homemade beer, hard cider, brick wine, or moonshine, or any combination of these basic, unrefined booze types, there will usually be some known businesses, meaning that you can already see their market clearly on the map, close by, run by people who already know and trust you. Some of these business contacts will be very keen to deal in one or more types of illegal booze, which they will sell on to their local customers under the counter or out the back door. From your perspective, they are all just the middlemen, the retailers. They just lack the regular wholesale supplier, and that's where you come into it. Load up your trusty old jalopy and get into it. But first, use the resources map overlay, which is the top left, or you can get there by quickly hitting your Z key for each of the booze types you have in your starting stock to see who's willing to buy what. At the beginning of the game, prohibition has already been around a few months, and the whole neighborhood is drier than the Mojave Desert. Each interested business will be willing to buy enough stock of your fine wares to last them a few weeks. Bear in mind that each turn in the game is just one week long, which means it will take several turns for these businesses to sell off most of your first delivery before they will have enough free space to accept another large load. As a general rule, don't bother trying to sell them more too soon after the last delivery unless you really just need a tiny little bit more of cash for something urgent or important. It's just a waste of your initial action points to sell in small quantities. Instead, look for new buyers able and willing to take on a significant quantity. You can also negotiate the price with business owners, either to offer them a discount, demand a higher price, or to accept the standard rate. No specific deal one way or the other, which is also the default if you don't haggle at all. Any deal you make will apply to all booze you sell to that person, whatever the type, and will remain in place for quite a while after. Eventually, the deal made with that buyer will lapse, and future prices paid will automatically revert to the standard rate, unless or until you renegotiate. Demanding a higher price obviously earns you more profit, while offering a discount has the effect of more rapidly building a very good relationship and earning more valuable favors from that person. Selling at this standard rate is the middle ground and results in a fair mix of earnings reasonable profit and also steadily building good relationships and favors owed. Which approach is best? Well, that's where things get tricky. While it may seem sensible to always just demand the extra money, you can never have enough after all, especially early in the game, 
If you really want to rapidly grow your business contacts, relationships, favors owed, and future available opportunities, then there are times when and situations where generosity on your part reaps its own rewards. It is really a question of the short-term gains versus the more longer-term lasting benefits and ultimately comes down to how you choose to build your criminal empire. The first important overall aim in the game is simply to earn $600 to $1,000 as quickly as possible, bearing in mind that you will also have about $150 to start, preferably on the very first turn. This is because it shouldn't usually take long at all for you to completely sell off your starting boost stocks, so you desperately need to get some form of regular boost production underway if you want to make it big in the bootleg industry. Quickly becoming a frequent supplier to your best customers will allow you to continue ranking in the dough on a regular basis. And so to more swiftly fund future expansions, luckily for you, not only does your starting base have a decent storage capacity, there's also a sizable empty back room here which the legal owner, a relative of yours, has agreed to let you use for your nefarious activities, such as maybe installing a new booze op production operation, it's nice to have family. Take a close look at this actual legitimate business run by a relative at the location. If you're very, very lucky, it could be something that is immediately useful to you and your future manufacturing aims. For example, some businesses may have a surplus casks of solid grape concentrate available every few weeks, which, it just so happens, can be fermented and turned into alcoholic brick wine with the right production setup. If it gets you drunk, who cares about the taste? A different type of legitimate business might instead yield surplus malt syrup every few turns, which someone with the know-how, you perhaps, can even produce homemade beer and so on. Whenever possible, choose the backroom production operation to set up based on the type of surplus resources actually being produced by this legitimate business cover, simply because that resource is free, ongoing, and regularly gets dumped into the storeroom there anyways. So you may as well make good use of it if at all possible. In particular, don't be put off from doing so just because there don't seem to be too many local customers for that particular type of booze right away, which can sometimes be the case. It's likely you will soon find more than enough eager buyers just an extra corner or two away, in one direction or another, and some of the existing business contacts may even be able to introduce you to buyers if you call in a favor or two. Aim to get together the required cash and set up the first booze production operation as your absolute top first overall priority because it will take time both to build the thing, five turns, and then move time, another three plus turns, to produce your first regular load of booze from it. The sooner it's underway, the better. You will probably also need to buy some stoneware crocs or perhaps a different raw material resource if your legitimate cover business actually produces its own crocs for your new production operation. Use the resource map overlay by hitting the Z key to find sellers of what you need. Make sure you have at least $100 on you and go stock up. This is extremely important because if a particular production operation doesn't have in storage absolutely everything it needs to produce a full load of booze by that final turn of production, then the production will stall and it will instead produce absolutely nothing. If by chance you haven't been lucky enough to have a viable production setup from the get-go, an example, if the starting legitimate business does not actually produce a basic resource, which you can immediately make use of, don't despair. This is often normally the case. The resources being produced by your starting legal business will definitely have a future use, so all is not lost. And in the meanwhile, there's plenty of space and storage to simply stockpile its output for now. It just means that you will have to spend a little more time exploring and talking to your contacts first, while selling your starting boost stocks and maybe also establishing one or two new fronts and instead focusing on building your territory protection income early to help get things rolling. In such event, look closely at the starting backroom production possibilities, especially concerning which you already have the actual skill to set up, usually only those near the top of the list at the start of the game and determine precisely which raw materials you will need to go ahead with one of those. Don't, for example, confuse malt syrup with corn syrup. Each resource serves as a different purpose. As you explore the area around you, making new contacts and calling in favors to build good business relationships, use the resources map overlay to help find precisely the resources you need. 
Even if there's no obvious supplier available for what you need, don't despair. Keep exploring, scoping out new businesses as you go, and talking to people. It's really only a matter of time before you will encounter someone offering you a suitable deal, especially look for the mission icon suddenly appearing below business markers on the map, indicating that the owner wants to talk to you about something in particular. If you agree to provide some starting cash in a few containers of a particular type, such as small barrels, they will happily provide the resources you want and deliver it where needed. These particular types of resource supply missions are actually also repeatable as often as you like. So ensuring both the continued supply and the ability to actually stockpile that resource, if so desired. When you finally have in storage everything your first backroom operation needs for its initial production run, the world is your oyster. And now is the time to further expand your business connections. And that gets us into relationships, influence, and favors. Every person you come into contact with will have a relationship with you based on your dealings with them, their family, and their friends. It can also help considerably if you have a shared ethnicity, ranging from very hostile to extremely friendly, but generally somewhere in between. This is shown as a handy relationship bar for each person you know, which to all intents and purposes can be considered your influence with that person. Mouse over the bar for a detailed breakdown. A green bar is good, red is bad. The higher the green bar, the better your relationship and the more influence you essentially have with them. So far, so elementary, but bear with me. Why is this important? Quite simply, you're dealing in illegal goods, namely bootleg alcohol, which some high and mighty holier-than-thou types have decided should be outlawed. This, is, of course, is the dumbest idea ever, but is also a superb one so far as you're concerned. These idiots actually created liquid gold. While many of the business owners in your neighborhood are also willing to quietly buy and sell the stuff, and don't be fooled by the type of legitimate business they operate, it could be literally anything. If they don't know you from Adam, then they simply won't trust you enough to buy from you. You could be a prohibition agent's stoolie trying to entrap them for all they know, so it is where it begins to get a little bit more complicated. You need to build that relationship, that essential level of trust, first. This is where extremely useful favors come into it. The better your relationship with someone, the more favors they will owe you. Do something for them, even just supplying their needs, and they will do something for you. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. After action points and ready cash on hand, favors are the next most valuable asset, so spend them wisely. One of the most useful favors someone can do for you is to introduce you to someone else they know, and to put in a good word for you in doing so. In vouching for you, they always give you a starting relationship bonus with that new contact, the extent of which will be based on how well they actually know this third person or how closely related they are, at least enough to instill a little trust and help them get over their initial reluctance to deal with you. This is something you can then build on to develop a long and mutually beneficial business relationship of your own, but it won't often happen without that good word on your behalf from someone they trust. Do you know anyone buying what I've got for sale or selling anything that I need is probably one of the most fruitful questions that you will ever ask a friendly contact. When available, and is one favor always worth calling in sooner rather than later. Available action points and other current priorities allowing, of course. There is also a very similar favorite request sometimes available relating to gaining an introduction with the local troublemakers. Example, a particularly, usually, fairly nearby corner hooligan. These are likewise often well worth pursuing action points allowing. Even if you're not interested in actually dealing with these minor thugs to any great extent, the relationship boost is usually sufficient to prevent that particular hooligan from directly attacking your crew for quite a while to come. Sometimes that newly introduced business or hooligan contact will be located on a corner you have yet to even explore, in which case the friendly introduction also brings you with enough useful local information to count that as an exploration move. That corner will be cleared and become visible on the map as if explored by yourself but without needing to actually move over there or spending five movement points to do so. It's a nice bonus. This is another good reason to always use do you know anyone type favor sooner rather than later. Example, before spending too many movement points actually exploring around that particular area. Favors also have many other uses in the game, and the topic is probably worthy of a strategy guide all on its own. But for now, at least, it's worth bearing in mind that when not needing to use your action points to actually sell your booze or buy needed resources, there will be quiet turns in this respect, especially in the early days, or to be introduced to brand new contacts, look to maybe call in some surplus favors to also help build existing relationships even higher. 
asking one known contact to put in a good word for you with a close family member or a good friend of theirs, even if you already know and deal with that third person, can often result in not only a better relationship with that person, which could lead to even more or better opportunities for you in the future if they like and trust you more. It can also earn you more actual favors with them too. You can then cash in some of these new favors to further spread your business contacts and to build better relations with them, even more existing contacts. Also earning even more new favors in doing so, ad infinitum, as Roman Empire builders used to say. Steadily but continuously building an extensive network of business contacts and overall good relationships is one of the cornerstones of your entire future criminal enterprise, if not perhaps the main foundation itself, since not much else can easily happen without it. Treat it accordingly. Just as you have family and other existing contacts in the neighborhood, everyone you come into contact will also have family, friends, and acquaintances scattered about. These social connections are extremely important in the game. When looking at a particular person's known contacts and their relationships, it is useful to bear in mind that they may often know people who are still completely unknown to you. After yourself meeting that third person by chance, by exploring a new corner and scoping out businesses there, the connection will thereafter be revealed. So we can also pay to check that new person's own contacts and see who else they already know. That may be able to put in a good word for you and help build this new relationship, particularly if it looks like a very promising one to have. Word of mouth is everything. Upset or harm the wrong person and you may find some others become more reluctant to do business with you. That guy you're about to muscle, beat up on, or perhaps even kill, maybe his cousin runs a business selling a valuable and fairly rare resource which you might desperately need real soon. Or maybe he has a nephew or niece who might one day even become your most skilled and valuable crew member. But probably not if you harm their beloved uncle anyways. Also by not checking the connection of the local hooligans or thugs you're about to kill or beat up, you might not be aware that they are actually the nephew or the sister of the local police patrolling your precinct. If you were to kill or harm one of them, it could make bribing that police officer extremely difficult for your significant future. If you're not careful, it's quite easy to shoot yourself in the foot in this game, and sometimes even without knowing it. On the other hand, helping other people or simply becoming good friends with them through a mutually beneficial or prosperous business relationship or by having a mutual friend put in a good word for you can bring you a significant advantage in the new opportunities, also not always immediately obvious in advance. Word of mouth works both ways. Think before you act in a way that could ultimately prove detrimental to you and ask yourself if you really need to get physical with that person. At the very least, check out mutually known connections before you act in an aggressive manner just to be better aware of who might actually become upset by any violent acts on your part. This applies to local corner hooligans and even rival gang members as much as it does to local business owners. Your most important supplier, most profitable customer, or best connected contact could actually be a relative or a close personal friend of that particular goon you're about to teach a lesson to just for the hell of it. Being Mr. Nice Guy, where most people are concerned anyway, will however also result in an increasing number of people coming to you seemingly with hat in hand, looking for a slice of your pie. Don't be fooled though, what may at face value seem to be just another appeal for a handout can often ultimately prove beneficial to you in one way or another. And not just in terms of building a better relationship with that person should you decide to help them out. Do weigh in all your opportunities carefully of course, but don't jump into negative conclusions just because you of how something may be worded in the dialogue. There's often much more to these seemingly hat in hand conversations than first meets the eye. Within just a handful of turns at most, you should generally find out that you've sold your starting boo stocks, your first production operation will be nicely underway and fully stocked with everything it needs. And you'll likely also have called in many available early favors as seems prudent to do, especially those offering introductions to brand new contacts. You should now hopefully have a bit of a breathing space before your new production operation churns out its first load of booze and you have to get back to selling, so use this time wisely. Beyond your own immediate neighborhood, you are aware of only the basic street layout, with no idea of what goes on behind the closed doors more than just a corner or two away. Double check how many turns you have free before your new batch of booze will be produced, and then roughly plan an exploration circuit to suit, bearing in mind that it will cost 5 movement points to each new corner explored. You will want to do this periodically in between future booze deliveries to gradually broaden your knowledge of what lies around you. Where possible, aim to always be exploring quite a way ahead of your actual territory expansion in any particular direction, so you can better plan in advance exactly which businesses might make the best fronts for your future expansion into that area. 
As you explore each new corner, any businesses located there will also be revealed, each costing one action point to then carefully scope out and learn what might be going on there of possible interest to you. Do take the time to also interact with each of these business owners after scoping them out. It doesn't cost AP. Although most will be unknown to you and vice versa and so reluctant to deal with you just yet, occasionally one may also know an existing contact of yours and would be pleased to finally meet you in person, having heard only good things about you. Those sharing the same ethnicity as you will generally also immediately be more open to a possible fruitful relationship, as will some business owners with certain traits, if particularly friendly, for instance. Also, interacting with each newly discovered business owner also gives you a chance to better assess how valuable that business might be in your future, either as a supplier or a potential customer, or perhaps even as a front for a local territory expansion. Check out the character traits of a potential front operator. In particular, for example, with a view to minimizing the hate they would generate in that role, or to determine how resistant they might prove to the idea of operating a front for your organization. Example, someone who is staunchy, upright citizen would outright refuse to become too closely involved with your illegal activities. As you explore in the early days, it's always worth remembering that it's often a good idea to back off a little or simply change direction when you encounter a hooligan or rival outfit territory, to avoid antagonizing them and becoming distracted by their tendency to leap into immediate hostility. You have more important things to do with your time and energies than to tussle with every two-bit low-life hoodlum out there. You have an empire to build. And also, bear in mind that all vehicles suffer wear and tear, and will slow down with increased wear. In particular, before heading out with what might be a lengthy exploratory journey heading well away from the friendly garage owner, do first check your vehicle status bar to see if there's anywhere near in need of repair. Let's move on to talking about fronts, territory, respect, and protection. First up, note that a front in this game refers specifically to a legitimate business owner you have convinced by calling in a favor to act as a local presence of your organization for the express purpose of building your local respect and extending the territory under your control and thereafter to collect on your behalf any protection money you may convince other, other local and nearby businesses to pay out each month. Conversely, the legitimate business providing hidden back rooms in which you can store resources and set up illegal operations, such as a starting safe house owned by your relative, are in this game known as cover businesses, not fronts. It is an important distinction to bear in mind to avoid confusion. Think very carefully about which business owners you approach to act as a front to your organization, and always take the owner's self-character traits into consideration, such as with a view of possibly reducing the heat they may generate in this role, or maybe their ability to more strongly resist a rival gang member's attempts to intimidate and subvert them. A person's traits may also affect their willingness to even operate a front on your behalf, sometimes needing a better, more trusting relationship with that person before they will agree. You may have a mutual contact to put in a good word for you to overcome their reluctance or perhaps merely to boost relations a little by delivering more boost to them first and this is something they're interested in dealing in. In addition to calling in a favor, each front will also cost you cash to set up. The amount increases substantially for each additional front based on the number of fronts already under your control and also costs more the further away in its own location relative to your original safe house. In effect, Future potential front operators know you need them far more than they need you, and they will change accordingly to compensate themselves for the risk involved, especially the further away they are from the protective heart of your outfit's territory. As soon as the new front is in operation, that corner will immediately become part of your territory. It doesn't need to be adjoining your existing territory or even anywhere near it for that matter. You can then instruct its owner to begin working on increasing your outfit's local respect and expanding your territory into an adjoining, uncontrolled corner. This takes both time to complete and a little bit of cash each subsequent month to maintain and increase your respect there. If the front expands into a corner you have yet to explore, upon completion that corner will clear and any local businesses will become visible on the map, as if explored by yourself. Although you cannot set up another front while an existing one is actively working on territory expansion, it is possible to instruct all existing fronts to simultaneously work on expanding your respect and territory in a particular area. Where still possible for each to do so, simply by visiting each one in turn and discussing the matter with them. 
Each front is capable of steadily extending your controlled territory into all immediately connected adjacent corners, so you will want to avoid overlapping potential expansion too much, as there's a little sense of having two fronts, both being able to expand to the exact same corner, since only one of them will do so. That said, depending on the local street layout, sometimes it may be better to overlap fronts expansions a little where needing to be very precise in their placement. Example, to avoid leaving too many gaping holes in your territory as you expand, especially perhaps in terms of the higher movement costs for rival game members moving into throughout your territory compared to them speeding whizzily through any gaps you have made conveniently left for them to use. Fully expanded into all adjacent corners, a front will typically cost $20 to $40 a month to maintain your respect and territory. And if this cash is not provided in a fairly timely fashion, you risk losing all the territory so far occurred around them. There are two ways to cover the cost maintaining your fronts and territory. The first is to visit them every month or so and simply hand over the necessary cash out of your own pocket, but it's perhaps not the best use of your personal time and energy, but necessary every now and then. The second way to pay for your fronts is to put in a little time and effort into extorting at least some of the local and nearby business owners by visiting them each of them in turn and asking them nicely to pay you $20 a month for protection from all those nasty people out there or else. You can only extort a business if it is located within territory you already control, which is just one good reason for steadily but continually expanding your outfit's territory. Once again, pay careful attention to the owner's character traits, as some will be more resistant to intimidation than others. Your local front will collect any such contributions for each month thereafter, will automatically subtract the monthly costs of maintaining your respect territory in that area, and will hold any surplus or profit for you to collect whenever you feel like dropping by to pick up. Bearing in mind it costs 1 p for each, so only do so when it's actually worth collecting, or if you really need just a bit more extra cash for some urgent purpose. Later on, with more crew members on your payroll, you'll be able to delegate and automate these envelope pickups, payments, and in fronts, owners, or monthly maintenance where needed. While the protection racket can build up and provide quite lucrative additional income stream, over time, do bear in mind that everything we have previously discussed concerning violent acts, social connection, and word of mouth, or else, to borrow an appropriate phrase, actually ruining your relationship with too many business owners for just the sake of $20 each per month could, could prove extremely detrimental in the longer term. Willing contributors, however, an example of those with whom you still have a reasonable relationship despite the negative impact of extorting them, are less likely to affect you badly in some way. And in time, most people will come to accept that the protection racket is just another unavoidable cost of doing business in this particular neighborhood. That said, while they may one day cease resenting it, that doesn't mean they will ever actually start liking it. A backroom operation is an illegal business set up behind the cover of a legitimate business. Your starting safe house being the first such building already available to you for this purpose as you grow your local respect and expand your territory with fronts and build up your business connections and relationships, new opportunities will become available to you via your business contacts to increase the number of backroom operations under your control by investing in other people they know who would be willing to run a new legitimate cover business for you. The base cost of investing in a new cover building in which you can then install a backroom operation is heavily dependent on the amount of storage space it has available. So the cost of just your second such building will on average range somewhere between $500 and $1,000 based mainly on its available storage capacity, but also on the rarity of this particular business type and other such factors as what, if any, useful resource it also produces. In addition, just like for establishing new fronts, the cost will also be higher the more cover buildings you've already control, and it's also further increased by the actual location relative to its distance from your starting safe house, just as it is for each new front. There may, however, also occasionally be a very pleasant surprise waiting for you in the new building storeroom, if you're lucky. There are three overall types of illegal backroom operations able to be set up in a controlled cover building, each requiring cash, one or more known skills, and certain types of construction resources to build. You must place the needed cash and materials into the building itself in order to set up its backroom operation. The same applies for any future upgrade or extension. Each building can have only one single backroom operation installed. However, so choose carefully from the options that you have available at that time, determined by the outfit-wide skills you have acquired up to that point, 
At backroom operations, essentially falls into one of three possible overall types. Type number one being a production operations. Those could include things like presses, distilleries, stills, bottling and manufacturing operations, those that refine ingredients into valuable resources, or logistics operations, such as a garage or a depot to do repairs on your vehicles or expand your fleet capacity, or a sales operation, such as a bootlegger, a speakeasy, a club, Buildings with higher storage capacity, those tending to be more expensive ones you can buy in, into at any given time, are perhaps best reserved for production facilities whenever possible, since these types generally have greater need for extra storage capacity in their day-to-day -day operations, especially when fully expanded and upgraded. While it's entirely possible to place a production operation in a smaller, i.e. general cheaper building, you may over time find that its more limited storage capacity proves problematic and could even hinder its smooth operation when you begin expanding and upgrading it. This is however still pure conjecture on my part, based entirely on the significant differences in available storage space for different building types noticed in the game. An example, there may surely be a good reason for the substantial size and cost differences and this is most likely one, the only one I can think of. I could be completely wrong though. In addition to strong supplies and alcohol output, any actual resources, any of your controlled buildings can also be used to store cash and spare weapons. Storage buildings is generally safer than carrying out any excess around with you in your vehicles, but given the game settings, there's a strong likelihood they may at times be raided by such as a prohibition agent and definitely by rival outfits once he's actually explored the area and learned of its existence. As a general, don't put all of your eggs in one basket if you can possibly help it. The term safe house is only a label, it's not one to be taken literally, even your starting one. As you expand, you will also be able to assign new crew members to act as managers for your various backroom operations. Where possible, choose people with appropriate character traits for the tasks you have in mind. For example, intelligent or hardworking people are ideal for managing production operations, while talkative, friendly, or kindly types are better suited to dealing direct with customers, either by making booze deliveries or by managing an actual backroom sales outlet of your own. All backroom operations have upgrades and expansions possible over time, again, derived from the actual outfit-wide skills your gang has acquired up to date, improving significantly the productivity and ultimately profits. In some cases, managers need specific traits or even particular personal skills for some much later high-level upgrades in order to take advantage of many backroom expansions. So choose your managers wisely according to trait descriptions and also increase personal skills appropriately when the opportunity arises. Speaking of your crew, the maximum size of your crew at any given time is directly linked to the amount of territory and the number of buildings you control. Every five corners or each new building allows one additional crew member. The rough idea being that for every five corners you add to your territory, you can also have one additional new member driving around and helping to keep things running smoothly. And for every new building you buy, you can also shortly after also hire a new manager for its backroom operation. The type of crew member you hire and the role you assign them is however entirely up to you and is more likely to be determined by the sort of people you currently have available for hire as well as perhaps such as your actual current truck capacity and spare cash with which you to invest into new vehicles. Generally speaking, the more good business relationships you have, the more options you will have in any number of types of people available to you to hire such as crew members, as many of your best contacts will know of interested people they can introduce you to as soon as you can spare some crew capacity. This is just one more reason why the bigger your network of good business relationships, the better. Hiring a relative or close friend of an existing contact will also boost your relationship with that particular contact. So even in this consideration may, at times, have some bearing on your actual choice for the next crew member. Your main consideration in choosing a new crew member, however, should concern their specific character traits and abilities. Some of these are clearly positives, such as intelligent, hardworking, strong, while some are decidedly negatives. Some are, however, very good in certain ways, or maybe specific situations but bad in others, some, some people can still be very useful, even advantageous for you if you are careful in the type of role or even specific task assigned them. Study the full descriptions for all the various character traits and abilities very carefully indeed to really make the most of each new crew member. 
One thing you should not do is wait too long before hiring someone new whenever you have that spare capacity and can afford to do so, even if you're not certain you can make full use of the person just yet. There are enough indications to suggest that both current crew size and their capabilities, such as available weapon types and quantity in particular, may also be certain traits and personal skills where these would logically enhance the fearsome reputation of your outfit and the underworld have a direct impact in various ways. For example, having a bigger, tougher crew will definitely help give your front operators the confidence they will need to more firmly resist any attempt by a rival outfit to intimidate or subvert them or nibble away at your territory. It stands to reason that this could be, therefore also be an important overall factor considered by the actual bosses of rival outfits when deciding if they should even risk making an enemy of you in the first place, although their own personality could at times be the main overriding factor in such decision making. All crew members gain experience while working for you often specific to the type of role they're currently involved in. Someone spending their time active on the streets and driving around will, like your boss character, be able to choose the skill gain in APs, MPs, or brawling. Regular delivery drivers will also have additional options for skill gain, specific and very beneficial to that role. Managers of backroom operations will instead gain experience in entirely different areas of expertise, some general in nature to all managers and some specific to the actual type of operation they are currently running for you. Specialization and expertise is likely to prove very advantageous in the long term, so again, Plan ahead whenever possible when deciding how best to improve each of your crew members' personal skills. Unsurprisingly, the people you hire to work for you expect to be paid. If they're not paid each and every week, they won't work. While any crew member out there on the street carrying some of your cash, example from selling your booze, will happily draw his or her salary directly from that wad in their pocket if needed, any crew members not necessarily dealing in cash, such as managers for your production operations, can only draw their salary from cash currently stored in any controlled building. No pay, no work. Unpaid crew will become unassigned from their current role, won't perform any work that week, and probably also won't gain any experience that turn and will need to be reassigned again. Always aim to leave enough cash in one or more buildings to cover your wage bill each turn, or ideally for several turns, to be on the safe side, to avoid potentially costly disruption to your vital operations. In the early days especially, this means that you will have to remain acutely aware of precisely when your next batch of booze will actually be produced and ready to sell, and be certain to not spend or invest too much of your current cash on hand before more will come up and again to cover your regular wage bill. In addition to skills gained personal to each individual crew member, mostly based on the role they are currently performing, there is also a significant number of broader outfit-wide skills which, once gained, may be utilized by any member of your outfit as needed. These main skills generally relate to background operations and associated logistics activities such as brick wine production, skill needed to install a backroom operation to produce, yes, you guessed it, brick wine. You start the game knowing only one of the two of these major outfit skills, and the pursuit of more, or at least should be, one of your main aims throughout the game, as there is a significant number and a variety of these to benefit from and to help grow your criminal empire in diverse and interesting ways. Also included in this category of skills are the ones needed to improve the actual efficiency and productivity of the various backroom operations in the form of expansions and upgrades for each, often specific to a particular type of operation. For example, your outfit having a sanitary measure skill will allow your managers to upgrade various types of their booze production facilities and gain some worthwhile benefits for a relatively low installation cost. There isn't any sort of tech tree in this game. Instead, these outfit-wide skills are gained from your various business contacts semi-randomly, usually as a reward for the completion of a mission. So once again, it pays to have a substantial network of good relationships, so you have a lot of new skill options to consider. Call in a favor, do something nice for them, often at considerable cost, sometimes in times AP and MP spent as well as actual money, and they will reward you with some new and very useful knowledge, while also looking even more favorably upon you as a result. You will generally find, if you steadily grow your business connections and relationships, that there is no shortage of new skills on offer, or at least the missions available to gain such. The limiting factor of any given time will instead be your inability to pursue them all straight away due to the simple lack of spare cash on hand, making it necessary to choose very carefully indeed which to pursue. 
There's probably little point in gaining a new main outfit skill unless you are fairly sure you can put it to good use shortly after. Otherwise, it will be a little more than a sinkhole for a sizable chunk of your working capital until such time comes as you can make proper use of it. Granted, if it sounds like something immediately worthwhile, sometimes you just have to take a gamble, cross your fingers, and hope for the best. Now let's talk about your cars and your trucks. All vehicles in the game fall into one or two broad categories cars and trucks. As you would expect, cars are generally faster but have a limited load space while trucks are slower but can carry much, much more. The number of each you can have available to your gang is determined by different things. The number of cars you can have is simply limited to the number of crew members you currently have, while your truck capacity is instead mostly determined by the number of parking spaces provided by your controlled buildings or certain types of purpose-built backroom operations such as garage, depots, and repair bays. Once you have gained the appropriate outfit skill for each, of course. Expanding and maintaining the logistical side of things will, over the course of the full game, undoubtedly prove every bit as important as building your production facilities, sales outlets, crew members, and outfit skills, available weaponry, network of business and underworld connections, and overall good relationships. Maintaining your delivery fleet in a good working order will also prove vital to the smooth operation of your growing criminal empire. All vehicles suffer wear and tear when in use and will require periodic repairs to avoid grinding to a halt by the roadside. Do keep an occasional eye on the status bar displayed below each vehicle in use on the right of the screen. Any friendly garage owner will perform you this service for a fee, usually 50 bucks to $150 if you have the cash on hand until such time as you are able to develop your own repair facilities. Be aware that you may also have to call in a favor for such an introduction, as these guys are just like any other business owner. They won't often deal with a distinctly shady looking character like you unless someone they trust tells them you can be trusted. They'll, then they'll quite happily turn a blind eye to the bullet holes, strong whiff of stale booze, and often suspicious looking cargo. In addition to ordinary wear and tear, vehicles can also suffer extra damage when you, in the vicinity of violence, so it's logical to assume that any actual gunfire is likely to increase both the risk and perhaps even the extent of the damage possible, maybe even depending on the actual number of people blasting away in the sidewalk shootout and the type of weapons being used. Keep an eye on this when the lead starts flying, just in case sudden major repairs are urgently needed. The prices of new vehicles can vary, so it may well pay to shop around. Always at least talk to every suitable business owner you come across and see what they have available and at what cost, even if they're not ready to buy. And make a mental note for future reference. Given the importance of relationships in this game in general, it's also worth noting that the better your relationship you have with the garage owner, generally the cheaper the price will be. Note that for some missions from businesses contacts can also provide you with additional vehicles, even cheaper than normal or simply being as a bonus for fulfilling that mission. As your organization grows, you will be able to automate many of the activities needed to maintain a well-oiled machine dedicated to churning out ever more profit. It is also relatively easy to adjust and fine-tune each of these over time to make sure each remains as time and cost efficient as possible. As things develop and expand, it will likely pay to occasionally double check each of the older automated routes in turn with an eye to tweaking some and make the most of the recent opportunities to ensure that each crew member assigned to automated activities is still doing its best job possible. If you guys haven't seen my video on how to best automate truck deliveries, you can check that out too for some additional tips. In addition to scheduling the delivery or surplus alcohol to your growing network of business contacts and buying in fresh supplies of needed resources, you will also be able to automate the process of moving resources between your own operations, such as regularly transporting basic unrefined booze, an example brick wine, to a separate refining operation, and of course supplying booze to your own established backroom sales outlets as a top priority, maximizing your profits by cutting out some of the middlemen. You'll also be able to automate the process of collection protection money from your various fronts as well as automatically providing your fronts with any cash needed to continue maintaining or expanding your respect and territory in that area wherever there is currently a shortfall due to the lack of local protection income, <laughs> i.e. extortion. Do remember, however, that cash is also considered a resource when automating things. It needs to be specifically dropped off and or picked up as needed and appropriate buildings along the scheduled route just as other resources are. The question of precisely when to begin automating things a little is an important one. 
On the one hand, your first additional crew member will prove absolutely vital to you in helping to free up more of your own time to devote to expanding your business contacts, setting up new fronts and dealing with their operators, building better relationships and exploring unknown territory, scoping out of new businesses. He or she could, for example, keep your booze, deliveries, and profits flowing smoothly while you are personally otherwise engaged, but to really make the most of this person's time as well, it is probably best done manually for a while as with your boss character's activities. Conversely, however, you would actually gain a further relationship bonus with each contact buying your booze if they know you value their custom highly enough to have become part of a regular automated delivery schedule, rather than just continue to be treated as just an occasional outlet as when you have spare stuff to sell. The sooner you can provide more of your valued customers with this high level of reassurance by being included and supplied as part of a regular automated delivery schedule, the better for your relationship with them. By the same token, while your production is limited and booze is still in relatively short supply, spreading it around to more contacts, some here, some there, may cost your first automated delivery crew member more APs and MPs overall, but in this instance at least, it may pay dividends in building more and better relationships over the wider neighborhood rather than just a small number of very local but often fully stocked businesses by including more of your customers on an automated delivery schedule and thereby potentially earning an extra relationship bonus with each of them. This could in fact be more useful if your delivery guy also happens to be the type that naturally gets along very well with other people, thereby earning an extra relationship bonus with each visit or possibly some other benefit during this re his regular dealings with them. And he or she may also work on improving appropriate personal delivery type skills to boost this further. It's all a matter of pros and cons, but it's certainly something worth thinking about. Now let's talk about the police. Each and every corner of the map falls under the jurisdiction of a particular police precinct and for each precinct, there will be one main cop physically represented on the map to show where such an increased police activity is taking place in the local area. From your point of view, however, you may also consider this person to be the local precinct bad man. The cop responsible for collecting payoffs from shady characters such as yourself and quietly spreading it around the boys back at the station so they are more inclined to look the other way and leave your crew alone to conduct your businesses and make money to continue paying them off without interference. Before the local cop bagman will even consider accepting a payoff from you, however, he will need to know and trust you a little, making it necessary to first gain an introduction from a mutual friend that can vouch for you. Cops are only human though, so they also enjoy being praised for their sterling efforts in maintaining law and order in the neighborhood and will respond accordingly if approached. Hypocrisy knows no bounds on either side of the law. Once you have the local cops securely in your pocket, you can thereafter effectively ignore the heat being generated by your outfit's criminal activities, at least while operating within any precinct boundary currently on your payroll. Given the nuisance potential of local cops, it is perhaps even worth studying the precinct map overlay very early in the game and decide where best to expand your initial fronts and territory, thereby reducing the amount of cops you need to bribe. This will become increasingly important as time progresses. Having friendly cops in your pocket also brings other benefits in addition to better protecting your crew, operations, and assets from interference, such as occasionally having to ready access to weapons confiscated from other hoodlums. Surely they can spare a little something for such a good friend as you. And if you're having trouble with a rival outfit or encroaching on your territory, maybe the local cops will be willing to use official channels to cause that game some legal problems on their own, and even outside their own precincts, since bootlegging is a federal crime, and their Prohibition Bureau may often rely on local police to tip them off about such activities. Having a dangerous rival gang member taken off the streets and locked up for a while would at least save you the trouble of having to send the boys around to um, reason with them. Now let's talk about those yellow street corner hooligans. They are just petty criminals and minor local street thugs who have staked out a single corner as their turf but lack either the brains, abilities, or ambition to aim for more than this. They will be found all over the city as you explore with each one's territory bordered in yellow and costing three movement points to enter. Many are very territorial and will object to your presence in the vicinity but they also chase and fight and sometimes succeed in killing each other as often as not. Each has a safe house in their own corner which may contain cash and other valuables for you or anyone else that whack that particular hooligan. Keep an eye open for these freebie gifts as time passes and their local thugs inevitably and sometimes fatally squabble among themselves. But bear in mind that you cannot carry away more than your own vehicle has free space for. But when that happens, you can just send it right back to one of your local safe house. It's probably a generally a good idea to remain on friendly terms or as friendly as these things get anyway with many of the local hooligans 
early in the game, but later on when you have superior weaponry, it's always fun to go in there to kill them and take their stuff, but be aware of who their family members are. Like in one of my playthroughs, I happened to kill a cop sister, and that made it very difficult for me to keep him on payroll. Now let's talk about rival outfits. Actual rival outfits, on the other hand, are a whole different kettle of underworld mobster. Expanding their red border territory just as you do on your own via the established uh, fronts and growing local respect, these are well-organized and sometimes well-armed gangs of tough hoodlums operating protection, cover buildings, and backroom operations just like you. There will generally be 5 to 10 rival outfits to contend with with the exact number mostly depending on which actual city you're trying to take over. Larger cities will naturally have more organized gangs fighting for control. Each outfit will be named after their boss, just as your own outfit is, and those names will become visible on the map, at least once some part of the rival gang's territory becomes known to you, and can be seen simply by zooming out a little. While our rival outfits may grudgingly respect your achievements and will probably tread more warily if you've considerably greater respect territory or a stronger crew, and perhaps especially if they are currently already fighting another nearby outfit, and while they will also find it harder to intimidate and actually subvert your fronts or take over your territory if you have more and better armed crew members than their gang, at the end of the day, it simply means they will view you as just as somewhat tougher nut to crack. All the indicators seem to suggest that it's not so much a question of if a particular outfit will come gunning for you, it's just a question of when. Being unlucky enough to have more than one rival outfit do so at the same time is likely to prove especially challenging. Interaction between different outfits in this game, including your own, is limited to either open rivalry, full-scale gang warfare, or just a shaky truce. There's no complicated diplomacy in this game. It's very cut and dry. Where possible, it can prove advantageous to time your own initiation of hostilities to coincide with an ongoing and brutally damaging war between two nearby rival outfits, although do bear in mind that helping to eliminate one of them won't make the other gang view as any more favorably. You'll usually just be considered the new potential competition for that now vacant territory. Since recuperating in a controlled cover building is usually the only early game means by which an injured crew member can regain their health, if you plan to initiate a major gang war with the aim of actually eliminating a substantial rival outfit and ultimately taking over their territory, do consider, if all possible, waiting till you can actually have a controlled building relatively near the gang's border and preferably one that is also able to conduct vehicle repairs. Bear in mind that the movement cost of driving through rival territory is 3 MPs per corner traversed, so it's just plain dumb to wage war too far away from your nearest cover building if you can possibly avoid doing so. Ideally, you'll want to make sure that any badly crew members can always make it back to a controlled building immediately on the following turn to avoid the great danger of being hunted down and easily eliminated on their way back, especially if their vehicle is also so badly damaged it's barely able to limp home, and then also be within immediate striking range as soon as they recover enough health. Outright gang warfare will undoubtedly often be a process of damaging and relentless attrition, so plan to at least some of your building's placements specifically to benefit from such a tactical advantage where it seems likely to be needed and thereby minimize your own losses the best you can. If you fail to keep your own fatalities to a minimum, it will certainly cost you in the long run, literally. The families of deceased crew members will require regular financial support for the remainder of the game, which, if you outright refuse to pay, will negatively impact your relationship with those in particular. Enemy outfits will aim to strike at your crew members on the street, your fronts, any fronts successfully intimidated and thereby subverted by enemy gang members could cost you all of your territory and protection income in that area if you don't respond quickly enough, plus time and a chunk of cash to actually reassert control, and even your backroom operations once discovered. The latter and their valuable, highly skilled managers in particular are likely to be prime targets once discovered by a particular enemy gang as these form of backroom productions of your are your entire criminal operation. They store the bulk of your booze and spare weapons, your cash, your resources, and they ultimately generate most of your income. Indeed, allowing rival gang members to scout out your territory unmolested may be in the vain hope that they're looking for some place where they can buy a decent can of oil is perhaps just begging to be hit anywhere where it really hurts, and probably sooner rather than later. Where rival outfits are concerned, it seems likely offense may at times prove to be the best form of defense. 
Time will tell. On the positive side, you'll also be able to loot the vehicles and buildings of deceased rivals up to your own vehicle load limits anyways. If not, they'll be sent back to a backroom facility of your choosing, which is actually a little bit more beneficial if you were to ask me. So some careful targeting plan raids on your part could be at times also proved to be extremely lucrative. Actually killing a rival gang member will however result in a protracted angry vendetta against you by that outfit. All that said, it's worth noting that only two of the 12 legacy goals, uh, i.e. the victory conditions of this game, are even vaguely related to actual gang violence in any way. This fact alone is a clear indication that this is most definitely not intended to be a game about making money purely in order to wage war, as so many other games are in their root, especially mobster games. Instead, City of Gangsters is a game where you sometimes have to wage war in order to protect the money you're already making, and yes, perhaps also occasion to smooth your way out into making even more. It's a fine distinction, but it's a very important one. At the end of the day, it's all about the money, not the body count. That's the real difference between a successful gangster and a dead gangster. Hi, my name is Adam, also known as Gamer Abroad. I'm an American immigrant living in Vietnam, working as an English teacher, but I'm also a gamer, just like you. This is not my main channel, this is my gaming channel. In order to encourage me to continue making these tips and tricks and guides and playthrough videos, please hit that thumbs up, please hit that subscribe, please leave a comment. And if you're interested in what it's like to immigrate and live as an expat in Vietnam, you can check out my main channel, GamerAbroad.com, or just search Gamer Abroad on YouTube. Anyways, whichever you choose, I appreciate you, you guys are awesome, and I hope you guys stay that way. <laughs>